willing to stand before people and say, I'm a good kid. I know all the stories. The Bible, I have all my stuff. I, I could teach the Sunday school class at seven years old if I needed to. I probably really couldn't. Um, but, you know, I felt that way. But there came a point in my life when I was 13 years old where I realized all that stuff that I knew and I did wasn't enough to save me. Jesus was better. That what I was trusting in, just like Paul, that what I was trusting in was my ability to save myself. What I was trusting in was my ability to keep myself clean enough, to keep myself holy enough. And I couldn't do it. And neither can you. We trust in Jesus because Jesus is better. He's better than self-effort. He's better than self-righteousness. He's better than your ability. Jesus is better. And what He accomplished in His life, death, and resurrection is better than all those good things that Paul could do, that I could do, that you could do. Jesus is better. And so seniors, students, adults, grandparents, great-grandparents, it doesn't matter how old you are, that you would find and understand that Jesus is better than anything. And that would change everything about your life. That aim, the direction of your life. See, for, for Paul, he was continuing on this road. He says it in Galatians chapter 1, 13 and 14, that he was advancing above, um, above those in his, his, like in his age range. And he was, he was getting better and more intelligent and, and more righteous and more holy than anybody else that he knew. But he figured out, he learned that it was meaningless, that it was pointless. And then he began to chase Jesus. And it changed his life. And so seniors, you've got this plan for your life. My plan for my life, which is laughable, but my plan for my life when I, when I was a senior in high school was that I uh, was going to be a radio broadcaster for the Astros. All right? I've got a great voice. <laughs> you can laugh at it, it's okay. Um, but that, that was my plan. And then as I, I graduated, I, I realized that I liked kids. and uh, Not in a creepy way, uh, but I wanted to be an early elementary uh, school teacher. And then I went to college and I discovered, ah, that's, you know, I took an education class. I'm not like that anymore. And so then I changed my major again. And then I discovered, ah, I don't like that. And so, so I think I went from elementary uh, to criminal justice. Yeah, this is just funny. Uh, I wanted to be a private investigator because I'm really nosy. Uh, I mean, it's ridiculous. Like, Kelly calls me Rosie because I'm nosy Rosie. And then Jack is like the same way. At, one, at, at like four months old, Jack was nosy. He'd be like, huh? Uh, and, and so she calls him RJ for Rosie Jr. Um, and so I was like, I could be the greatest private investigator ever because I could just watch people and be nosy and dig in their stuff. I'm okay with that. And then I discovered, because I took a criminal justice class, that, man, that's hard. That's hard stuff. And so then I was like, oh, I'll know what I'll do. I'll be a social studies teacher. There we go. I love history. And so I started pursuing that. And I took like all but one history class that went Mesa offers. No, two. Two history classes that went Mesa offers. And then finally, I got to the point, I'm like, if I do this, I'm going to be in school for another three years. And at this point, I was already in year four. Um, and so I switched my degree and. I stand before you now a bachelor's in general studies. <laughs> and so I had all these plans, all these dreams, all these desires. And I graduated from college and I worked at a, a bookstore in Lake Charles, a Christian bookstore in Lake Charles for like a month and a half. And then one day God opened the door and blessed me and I walked, I walked back in for my lunch break and I said I quit. And they're like, can you work through the weekend? I'm like, I'll work Saturday and that's it. Uh, and that was like on Friday. And God opened the door and he allowed me to teach for a couple of years. And those were some of the greatest years of my life. I got to, to shape and mold some, some children and love on some children that really needed that. That needed someone to love and encourage them. Um, and then God just continued to guide and shape my life. And he, you know, God has a sense of humor. And I swore when I, and I guess I shouldn't have sworn, but I did when I was like 14 that I would, I went to New Orleans for a Promise Keepers conference. Uh, no, I was 13. Um, and I swore it was in New Orleans and I swore I'll never go back to New Orleans. And wouldn't you know, God called me to go to seminary in New Orleans. 
Uh, I was there for, I stayed on campus, sort of, for a semester. Uh, and then I came home and I, and so I had all these plans, I had all these dreams. But when I found and I discovered and I understood that Jesus was truly better and, and trusting Jesus and obeying Jesus was better than anything, God changed my path. God changed my direction. And it doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are. If we trust that God is better, that Jesus is better, and His plans and His, His dreams for our life are better than anything that you can ever imagine, God might lead you in a completely different direction. God might lead you in the same direction that you've been headed. Because God wants to use you to be a teacher or a welder or whatever it is that you do. That God can use you to bring glory to His name in that situation. But it all stems from this simple question, is Jesus better to you? So Paul's the direction in Paul's life, it changed. Now, I've kind of gotten off track and I wasn't really planning to go there this morning, but I want to, I want to throw this out there. Maybe what you're chasing is not religious performance. See, Paul was trusting in his religious performance. Maybe what you're chasing after and what you're, uh, you're pursuing is more like Solomon. Now, I can't really help but think, but think, and when I think about Paul, and I think Paul stands here and he's like, I have it all religiously. I can't help but think of Solomon on the other hand. Solomon had wealth and wisdom and women and power. But what did Solomon say as he pursued each of those things to the nth degree? Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. Everything is meaningless. And he says in Ecclesiastes 12.1 to pursue God while you're still young. Don't chase after those dreams because that's what you think is going to get you what you want in life. But rather chase God and let Him guide, let Him direct your life. Because Jesus is better. So we see in this passage of Scripture that Paul found that on the road to Damascus, and it changes everything about him. So my question to you this morning, one of my questions to you this morning is this, is what is it that rivals your trust in God? What is it that rivals your trust in God? See, for Paul, it was religion. For Solomon, it was wealth, wisdom, women, power. What is it that rivals your trust in God? Are you trusting in God more than anything? And here's the reason you trust in God. We're going to, we're going to finish up these, these last few verses. Uh, and, and then you can go home and finish taking your naps. Uh, verse 9. Actually, at the very end of verse 8, he says, In order that I may gain Christ. And in gaining Christ, he gains this. Verse 9 now. I want to be found in Him. Not having righteousness, having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. But that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. And they share His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death. That by uh, any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. And so Paul says this. When I, when I in, in killing Christ on that road, and then I go and I spend this time with Ananias, and he's teaching me, and he's discipling me, there's a few things that I came to realize. And one of the things that he came to realize is this. Is he had been on this cycle, this road of trying to perform, that he's, trying, he's striving after um, the law and he's trying to keep it and make sure he does enough good and make sure he doesn't do too much bad so that he can remain in right standing and remain blameless. But over and over, what does he find himself having to do? He's got to go back to, to the temple. He's got to go back to the altar. He's got to make sacrifice. He's got to kill the goat. He's got to kill the, the bull. He's got to pour the streak off. He's got to wait. He's got to do all these things. And what did he find? He's doing them over and over and over. Because Paul came to realize, finally, after however many years of life, he finally came to realize the point of the law was never salvation. The point of the law was to point that I need salvation. And that I need salvation in Jesus Christ. And so he finds these things in Jesus Christ. Number one, he finds this, the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. He says that in verse 9. He says, not having a righteousness of my own, but one that I find in Christ. Paul was trying to earn righteousness. What he found when he said that all that stuff over there was meaningless and pointless is this, is the righteousness that he had been chasing after all those years, he found in Christ. That God clothed Paul in the righteousness of Christ. Paul is in right standing with God, not because of what Paul could do, 
because of what Christ had done for Paul. And the same is said for you and for me, that we are not righteous because of what we have done or because of who we are, but because of what Jesus has done on our behalf. Are you covered in the righteousness of Christ? Graduates, as you move to the new chapter of your life, are you covered in the righteousness of Christ? Or are you trying to earn it yourself? Are you trying to guide and direct your own life? And the other thing that Paul says that he finds is this, is the transforming power of the resurrection. In verse 10 he says, And I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. It's because Jesus is alive that we are molded and shaped more and more to it, into His image. The power of the resurrection is transforming. It's the power that's at work within us so that we may desire to work according to God's pleasure. It's the power that is at work within us to make us holy. It's the power at work within us to help us understand God's great love and mercy. And it's the power that gives us strength to endure life's hardships. So the power, the transforming power of the resurrection. So you can talk about justification. You can talk about sanctification. Verse 9 is justification. God made it just as if I'd never sinned, but then He covered us in the righteousness of Christ. And now He sanctifies us. He transforms us more and more into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. And then the last step is glorification. What does He say in verse 11? That I may by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul's great hope in life was that this isn't it. And I think that's something that, especially for, for those of us that are younger, that we need to come to realize that this isn't it. The house and the car and the family, and I, I, I love my house and I love my truck, although I don't take good care of it because it's really dirty. And my family, I love my family. I, I love my, like, today Jack's been away. My mom picked him up Friday. I haven't seen him since Friday. And so as soon as senior lunch is over today, I'm kicking him out. I'm cleaning the kitchen real quick, and I'm going to get my baby because I love my baby. And I'm going to hug him, and I'm going to make him kiss me because he's, now if you look at him, you call him and he says sugars, and he'll go. Sometimes he comes at you with open mouth, and you're like, hmm, much, dude. He gives five, and it's sweet. He's just, he's, I love my family. But that's not it. The greatest hope is not that we have a family, that we have a good job, that we have a great career, that we have a nice vehicle, that we have a nice house. But the greatest hope lies above us. And that doesn't mean that we just keep our eyes there and don't worry about all those things. Because I love my son and I want my son to spend eternity with his, both of his fathers. So I'm going to pour my life out so that my son knows Jesus Christ. Because of the hope, the glory. So there's justification, there's sanctification, there's glorification. We realize and we understand that obeying and trusting and following Jesus is better because this isn't it. That doesn't mean we just sit there and say, well, if this isn't it, I don't need to try. No, go get an education, go get a job, work to provide for your family, love your family, teach your family about Jesus. But don't chase this. And by this, I, don't, I mean this. These are not the ultimate pursuits. The ultimate pursuit is Jesus because Jesus is what? Jesus is what? Alright. J.I. Packer says this. Once you become aware that the main business that you are here for is to know God, most of life's problems fall into place on their, on their own accord. Because God is God. And so... Those of you that are graduating, you're like, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. It's okay. I changed my major five times with me. I graduated with a Bachelor's of General Studies. And it's okay. People will hire you, right? Because most of you voted yes. And you saw that on my resume. <laughs> like, this guy's aimless. We should not hire you. Jesus is better. Wherever He leads you, that you would trust Him in all things. But again, this isn't just for our seniors. It's not just for those who are in high school, or junior high. It's for all of us. What if tomorrow you're retired, you've been retired for years? What if God 
you're, you're in the Word and you're in prayer and God laid upon your heart that what you should do is come out of retirement like Michael Jordan and you should be a missionary. You should uh, work at Vacation Bible School. You should uh, be a youth volunteer. You should be our new children's ministry director. If God laid that on your heart, would you obey that? Would you step into that obediently, knowing and understanding that Jesus is better? Would you be disobedient? Be like so many people in Scripture. Is Jesus truly better? Is He truly the love of your life and your heart's greatest desire? So as we come to this time of invitation, I'm asking you to bow your questions. Everybody, nobody's excluded. Everybody, bow your Those of you who come up here and lead us in this time of worship, come on. I want to pray for us, and I'm just going to invite you to to respond to God as as it, however God would have you respond. If you're here this morning, you have never found and trusted in Jesus that Jesus is better. If you're trusting in yourself and what you can do, or you're chasing after something else, that you would would come and you would fall at the feet of Jesus and say, "You are better," and I I want you to to to, to live inside of me. I want you to change and transform my life. Whatever it is that God has laid upon your heart. You would step into that obediently, knowing, understanding that Jesus is better. So I'm going to pray. We're going to stand and we're going to sing. Father, we love you. And we love you because you loved us first. And that's what makes it possible for us to love you and to know you and to trust in you. And so, Father, I pray that in these moments as we come to this time of invitation, that we would respond to you obediently. Because, God, that's the only way to respond to you. God, you deserve and you desire our wholehearted, full-hearted commitment. And so, God, help us to trust in you. God, move in these moments as only you can. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So as we stand in the